Right. Uh, welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2023, brought to you in partnership with our platinum supporters, Google and Intopia, and our gold supporters, Barrier Break and Tetralogical. You can follow us on Macedon, and if you have any questions for the presenter, uh, please post them using the ID24 hashtag. Alternatively, uh, you can also put your questions directly into the YouTube chat for this particular session, and we'll pick out the best ones uh, at the end for our Q&A session. Uh, on that topic, a reminder that ID24 is a respectful community, and you can find our code of conduct on the ID24 website. So don't misbehave. Uh, I am thrilled and honoured uh, to be joined by my co-host uh, Ian Lloyd here. Ian and I go way back, uh, and probably we don't want to go into all the, the lurid <laughs> details, but uh, on that note, uh, over to you, Ian. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Next, we have Sveta Dinova, who will be talking about ergonomics, aesthetics, politics, and things that can make us uncomfortable. I do have a comfy seat here, so I'm looking forward to settling in and hearing what she has to say in this presentation entitled Sitting Comfortably, a design lesson from chairs. Over to you, Sveta. Thank you so much, Ian and Patrick. I will go full screen. Um, so hi, everyone. Today's talk is titled Sitting Comfortably, Design Lessons from Chairs. I will start with uh, the agenda. So we'll look, we'll do a short intro, then we'll look at some chairs. We'll then move on to talk about ergonomics. And finally, we will look at the takeaways from this presentation. So, hi, my name is Tsveta. I am a uh, white female in my early 30s with brown hair and brown eyes. I'm currently wearing a gray jumper um, and my pronouns are she, her. I wanted to do a short intro on my background um, because I think it's related to the presentation. Hopefully it will make sense while I'm talking later about design. Um, but I studied product design in London um, and then I moved on to work as a furniture designer, which at the time was my dream. I went and designed some furniture for hospitality. I subsequently got a bit disillusioned with the industry, uh, which prompted me to go back to school to focus on what I thought was actually important, which is people. So I went and studied social anthropology. I then... Um, worked at the Design Museum in London, where I designed their um, digital design curriculum. And um, coming to kind of my current role, which is um, digital accessibility lead at ASOS.com. Now, for years, I was a little bit self-conscious about whether the transition between all of these kind of stages of my professional career life uh, made sense. But hopefully today's presentation will show you how all of these things kind of tie together quite nicely, I think. Um, so going back to the time when I was in university, I uh, was lucky enough to live and breathe design for you know a couple of years while I was there. And I have selected here some of the books that I think really influenced the way that I think about design. Um, so those are History of Modern Design, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman, and A Thousand Chairs by Charlotte and Peter Field. Now, it might sound like these are books on kind of very different subjects, and what is exactly the relationship between, you know, user-centered design and furniture or chairs, which is something I was always really interested in. Um, but hopefully we'll, we'll see that in the next few slides. So I think chairs are a very important design object because they are to me a design archetype. So we encounter chairs from pretty much the day that we are born. They're every day around us in our kind of everyday surrounding. They have been designed and redesigned again and again, and they will continue to be. Um, yet, even if we come across a very abstract kind of chair, uh, 
we look at it and we know exactly what it is. And I think this is why chairs can kind of teach us a lot about humanity, about our lives, about our history. Um, and I will start this argument uh, by talking about the fact that chairs are history. Um, they have been, I think, around ever since humanity probably started walking on, on two uh, feet and we had to sit down somewhere. So I imagine the earliest chairs were, you know, um, appropriated kind of like, um, you know, pieces of rock or pieces of wood or anything people could sit on. And then some of the earliest examples of, of actually purposefully made chairs and actually design made chairs are um, Egyptian stools, which were made from, you know, precious materials. They were made by craftsmen. And most importantly, they were made specifically to fit the human um, kind of shape so that they were comfortable. Um, then we move on to, you know, ancient Rome, where you could kind of see like a status differentiation between, you know, people who had access to an actual um, tabouret or a, a, what we now call a kuro stool, um, which was kind of a, a cross stretcher base with a little cushion on the top. But those were mostly available to Roman magistrates. So the common people were more likely to sit on a hard surface rather than on something that was cushioned. Then we move on to something like the Tone number 14 chair, which is the famous uh, kind of chair from the 19th century, which was probably the first example of mass produced furniture um, using steam bending techniques. And it's a chair that exists today and is still quite popular. It's probably kind of a very successful example of a mass produced design object. Um, we can then look at something like the Barcelona chair, um, which was designed by Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reif for the German pavilion at the Barcelona Expo in 1929. Ironically, the chair was kind of modeled after the Bauhaus philosophy of providing, you know, common um, quality products to common uh, people. Uh, but the irony here is that the chair was actually made for the Spanish king for the opening ceremony of the expo where he could sit on the chair and observe everything that was happening um, and kind of following, I suppose, that ironic pattern of the history of this chair. This chair is nowadays considered to be, you know, um, a very high end design piece and you will see it in, in a lot of like luxury interiors. Um, and then we can also like look at something that is from our kind of current times, um, the IKEA Poang chair, which is um, their most famous armchair that was first conceived and designed in the 1970s. And since then pretty much sells in the millions each year. It's a design piece that is available to a lot of people across the world. And we've probably at some point encountered one in our kind of lifetime, whether we've seen one at IKEA or we've sat on one in our homes or in our friends' homes. So I guess the idea here is that chair design does track historical events and it does track, um, you know, a lot of things that have happened to humanity over time. Um, but it also has other um, kind of connotations around status, which is something I mentioned earlier. So from very ancient times, we've got murals where you can tell that the important people were the ones that sat on chairs, whereas the common people were not didn't necessarily have access to chairs. They might have sat on like harder surfaces. Um, we also have the example, again, going back to the Barcelona stool, as I mentioned that this chair is, um, you know, it's a symbol status. It's a status of wealth. It's a status of, you know, good design taste. And you can see that um, in a lot of films. You can see that in a lot of, as I mentioned, high-end interiors. Um, and then we have the ultimate symbol of status when it comes to chairs, which is the throne. So what was the throne? Um, it was a chair made specifically for a person. Um, in order to kind of differentiate that person from the rest of the population. So in order to tell us that this person is important, that he or she is a king or a queen, um, 
And this is why I find this image ironic because you have um, French President Emmanuel Macron, who is a Democrat, sitting on what looks like a throne. But then we can have exactly the opposite through chair design. So we can, through kind of looking at uh, specific uh, chair designs, we can talk about democracy. So one of those um, examples is the monoblock chair, uh, which was initially conceived in the 1950s. Uh, it was an experiment with a new type of technology that allowed quick production um, quick and cheap production of chairs. So we started off with some more high-end pieces like the, the Panton chair. Um, you can see here in the image, but um, eventually what that led to was actually a very kind of uh, high volume, cheap production of chairs that are probably the most common chairs that we see around the world today. So each one of us has probably encountered this chair at some point. We've seen it on pictures. Um, the chair even got its um, own book recently of photographs from people around the world sitting on a simple plastic chair uh, that is, again, cheap to produce, um, cheap to sell, and then also relatively comfortable. Again, I, find, I found this image and I was quite keen to include it here because I, I really like the juxtaposition of, you know, you see here Muammar Gaddafi, who is the former totalitarian leader of Libya and once amongst, you know, the most powerful men in the world, sitting on a simple white plastic monoblock chair. Um, so the I suppose this is the, the idea that um, democracy through design is so pervasive that even, you know, important people you know, in, in other situations could have sat on thrones or, you know, very high-end chairs can actually end up sitting on a simple chairs that all of us might have access to. And then we can start talking about, you know, moving on from democracy, we can start talking about aesthetics. So how do you take something so simple as the simple plastic monoblock chair and turn it to um, an elevated kind of aesthetic design piece. So in this case, we've got the monoblock chair weaved into like a bigger structure using, you know, organic rattan um, kind of materials and making that into an object that is potentially more desirable, potentially more expensive um, and potentially more comfortable. We can also look at um, little kind of play on shapes. So this is the Louis Ghost chair by designer Philip Stark, where he took the monoblock kind of production methodology and he created a piece that takes the shape of a more high-end object, potentially um, a, a Rococo object that could fit more nicely with, um, with more kind of high-end and expensive furniture. So a play on, you know, does this chair always need to be um, democratic and does does this type of production methodology always need to be so kind of readily available and then we can look at something like um, sustainability activism or basically taking the same production ideology that we're you know cheap production quick turnaround of production and actually creating a piece that is sustainable and is made of more natural fibers to kind of contradict the idea that, you know, a cheap, um, readily available chair would necessarily need to be out of plastic, which as we know today um, is a big problem that we have in, in kind of mass production. So I guess what I was trying to say with these slides is that chair design can be a metaphor for many aspects of life. Um, and as such, it can be a source of inspiration and valuable lessons, and I think valuable lessons, particularly when it comes to inclusive design. But let's take a step back and actually talk about the main purpose of chairs, which is for us to be able to sit on them. I'd like to start with um, two kind of takeaways, my main takeaways from um, my design degree. The first one was that um, only 10% of people who study design will actually end up um, working in design, which is, I guess, 
um, I'm a good representation for, for that. Um, and then designing for the extremes is where innovation happens, which I, I suppose more relevant to what we're talking about today. So what does that mean, particularly in the context of furniture design and more specifically chair design? I think my slides are a little bit slow to change. Okay, so in order to understand the idea of designing for the extremes and how that benefits inclusive design, we need to look at ergonomics and anthropometrics because we're talking about chairs. So ergonomics is uh, being the study of uh, humans interacting with products around them and anthropometrics being quite important here because we are talking about furniture and anthropometrics is actually um, the gathering of data um, from humans, so bodily measurements, in order to help um, inform ergonomics for a specific product. So I want to talk about anthropometric data for a second here. Um, when we gather um, a set of anthropometric data about humans, what we um, might want to do is look at the frequency of occurrence of certain measurements. For example, if we are collecting or looking at measurements around stature, we might plot those on a graph and what we normally end up with is a bell curve. So what happens with that bell curve is that the center portion or like the highest part of the bell is where you've got the highest frequency of occurrence of a certain measurement. So for example, a certain um, height of a person. Um, and then right in the middle, we've got the average. Um, so that is kind of the, the highest part of the bell. And then on both sides, kind of the lowest points, it, we've got the, um, the smallest 5% and the largest 5%, also known as the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile. Now, why is uh, kind of this important? Because um, statistically speaking, most designs would aim to cover the middle kind of 90%. So the idea is because we've got the, the, um, the most kind of frequency of occurrence of certain measurements there, most designs will kind of aim at those 90% and they will most commonly ignore the smallest 5% and the largest 5%. Now, the slight problem was that is that um, you are covering a large portion of the population, so 90% of the population, but obviously the, the percentage of people that you're ignoring here exponentially grows. So if you are designing for 10 people, you're only ignoring one. If you're designing for you know 100 people, you're ignoring 10 and so on and so on until eventually you end up with quite a big portion of the population that you might potentially be excluding or ignoring with the designs that you're creating. There is also something else. Um, a lot of designers historically and nowadays as well would look at the graph and they would look at the highest point of the bell curve and they would look at the average, which is right in the middle. And they would say, okay, I am going to be designing for the average user because if I do that, I'm probably going to be able to cover everyone else, right? Or at least the people in my kind of like mid 90%. Um, however, that is not true. Um, there is a, a very kind of famous story that we were always told when we were um, in design school, which was around um, kind of the case of uh, in the 1950s in the US Army, they had a lot of um, uh, accidents with their um, aircrafts and their pilots. And they were trying to determine why those accidents were happening. Um, and what they figured out is, you know, we're designing those aircraft cockpits um, around an average pilot. And our, our averages haven't really been updated for about 30 odd years at this point. So maybe we need to update, update the averages and, you know, measure the people again. So they took a sample of about 4,000 pilots measured took very, very detailed measurements of um, kind of anything from height to width to, uh, you know, very, very specific, like smaller measurements. And then obviously plotted them in order to understand the frequency of occurrence of these measurements. 
and then determined what their average is based on that. Um, and once they did that, they said, OK, let's see how many people actually fit within the average. We're going to give an allowance of about 30 percent. So if you're 30 percent kind of off uh, that kind of ideal statistical average, we're going to say you still fit within the average. And so they went, uh, looked at their data and they realized that actually nobody fits into their average. Um, so that is a very good kind of the, the the takeaways from this story is a very good example of why if you are trying to design something to fit anyone and everyone, you're simply going to end up failing all of your users because the average is a is a statistical idea, but realistically, when you look at you know data, you don't have an ideal average user because that person just doesn't really exist. Um, and I suppose this comes down to how we correctly use anthropometric data, particularly, again, when we're talking about, you know, designing physical objects. Um, the idea that, you know, in certain situations, you definitely have to consider the smallest, so the, the fifth percentile, like the smallest people and potentially the weakest people. Um, and this is a, a really good example of this is, um, creating uh, doorknobs. So making sure that even the person with the smallest and the weakest hand is going to be able to open that doorknob. And then also looking at everyone else and making sure that that design is also going to fit them. The same thing counts for, um, you know, in, in some instances, you need to look at the 95th percentile where you need to make sure that the biggest and widest person can actually, uh, you know, use your design. So a good example for that is, cinema seating, making sure that, you know, a really big person can fit in that. And I think one of the most obvious examples is, um, you know, doors and door frames, because you want to make sure that um, a really big, really wide person can fit through that um, door frame. And then if that's the case, everyone who's smaller can also fit to that. But what happens with, you know, products where it's not really obvious where you need to kind of look into? which is probably the majority of our everyday products, anything like chairs, desks, tables, anything like that. Um, so back to the story of the US Army and the pilots, um, what ended up happening when they realized that no one fit within their average user is they started making things, they started well thinking, how can we actually make individual adjustments for every person? And they started making a lot of, parts of that cockpit actually adjustable. Um, so what that allowed them to do was, um, you know, to, to basically create a, um, a setup where every pilot could go into the, the cockpit and adjust anything from the chin strap on their helmet to, you know, the position of their seat to anything else that they might need to look into. And this kind of set a precedence to you know, a lot of products that we use today that actually need to fit a wide variety of people. And a good example of that is um, office chairs. And the reason why they are very often adjustable is because they are created to fit a wide variety of people. And the other option would be to create different sizes of chairs, which is from a production perspective, more expensive. Um, hence why, you know, a lot of um, kind of furniture that is meant for wider use in offices and in public spaces is often adjustable. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to cover the whole kind of like range of sizes from the first to the set to the hundredth percentile, but it does mean that it allows for bigger flexibility, at least within the 90% that we have kind of in the middle. So that's all kind of very good and well in theory, but what if we look at actual examples um, and understand where these things come into play? So I'm gonna present to you a short hospitality case study based on my work as a furniture designer. So as I mentioned, when I graduated from my design degree, I had the opportunity to go and um, pursue what was my dream at the time, which was to um, kind of be a furniture designer. I joined a um, 
a design studio, an architectural design studio that was kind of focusing on doing interior work for different um, kind of hospitality um, companies. And one of the projects that I got put on at the time was to help design the furniture for um, an Asian restaurant concept. So um, me being the excited kind of fresh out of school design student, um, I came into the studio and I started talking about user-centered design. I started talking about, you know, furniture being um, comfortable, making it comfortable for the people that are going to use it. And I very quickly realized that these things are all well and good in theory, but actually when you go into um, an actual job, you're not necessarily going to have the opportunity to apply the things that you've learned. Um, and why is that? Because specifically in the case of restaurant furniture and restaurant chairs, they are not made to be comfortable. The whole purpose of restaurant furniture is to get people in, get them to eat, um, and get them out of the restaurant so that another set of people can come in. Um, from that perspective, uh, uh, furniture for restaurants is actually considered to be kind of short stay furniture. So in many ways, it is acceptable that chairs are not necessarily made to be comfortable. But one of the most important things is that you're actually trying to get as many people around the table as possible. Um, so trying to get as many chairs around the table and people on them to be able to sit. Another thing that's a consideration when you're doing, um, when you're designing furniture for restaurants is um, making chairs fit on top of the table. And what that means is that at the end of the day, we need to actually lift the chairs onto the tables in order to clean and sweep the floors. So that's um, one thing that determines uh, kind of the size of the chair and how it fits on top of the table at the end of the day. And then whatever other considerations are actually left are usually going to refer to that average user, which as we already know, is probably not the best way to approach, um, you know, approach the design of any product. Um, so this is the chair that, one of the chairs that I ended up designing for this concept. Um, and I, as the person who's designed it, as the person who sat on it, um, unfortunately, I know where the flaws are. And I have been, you know, thinking about these flaws for, you know, many years. And I wanted to talk about them today um, because what really bothers me is the idea that this chair is not made for the customer. It's made for the table. It's made for the restaurant. It's made to fit people. It's made for commercial purposes, but it's not necessarily made to be comfortable to those sitting on it. Um, so first of all, one of the first things that you notice when you sit on this chair is that this, the actual seat thickness is too low. So when you try to sit on this chair and pull it with you closer to the table, it's actually really hard to, to do that, which um, ends up working out as a little bit of a shimmy, um, which makes it kind of really awkward to sit on and, and use. Um, the chair height doesn't take the cushion into consideration, which is usually done. What that means is that the chair is sometimes a little bit too high for, for the needs of some people. Um, obviously, that's, in some situations, that's not necessarily uh, a bad thing because, uh, for example, users with um, problems with their legs or elderly users can actually uh, stand up easily when the chair is higher. However, another problem we have is that the chair seat is a little bit too deep. Um, so that also makes it a little bit higher to a little bit harder to actually get up and um, you know, especially after you've sat down for a while, potentially you have there and then you're you're kind of trying to get up, maybe your your legs are, you know, a little bit tired. Um, and then one of the other things that particularly bothers me about this design is that the backrest is too low, which doesn't make it particularly comfortable for you to lean back and actually spend um, a long time sitting on this chair. But what if we 
kind of, you know, what if I was to redesign this chair again and to, uh, you know, potentially leave aside all the commercial considerations around tables and fitting a lot of people together and things like that? What if we stuck to the quote unquote proper measurements? Um, so I found here a diagram which is um, actually very um, similar to the diagram that I first encountered when I was in university and I was learning how to design furniture and chairs in particular. And the diagram um, talks about the kind of ideal seat height, ideal seat depth, you know, distance um, of the of the backrest, uh, the slope of the seat and, and stuff like that. So apart from the fact that some of these numbers are taken and extracted from the averages that we we previously talked about, you know, the average height and the average weight and, and the average leg length. Um, another thing that particularly kind of bothers me is where those numbers, where that data is, like the anthropometric data for this is actually taken from. So some of the common anthropometric databases that have been used for the past century, well, at least 50 years, and are still largely in use today are based on data collected from uh, US military personnel, um, which I think is quite, um, you know, narrowing when it comes to kind of a wider population. Um, there are later kind of databases that were created based on, you know, civilian populations. And of course, a lot of these databases are updated um, to a certain extent. But what really bothers me when it comes to anthropometric data and, and the data that we commonly use is that um, a lot of the times it is very kind of Eurocentric, North American centric, potentially, you know, not, not focusing on a wider um, kind of like um, sample of different races, different ethnicities that we already know have different um, anthropometric um, kind of measurements that they can, um, you know, requirements basically that um, might benefit kind of a wider sample taken from more people. So if we are designing a chair uh, for a restaurant in a multicultural city like London, for instance, how are we to kind of trust when we are designing this chair based on, on data that doesn't necessarily cover everybody who might encounter this chair, might need to use this chair. So we're talking about um, database bias, basically. Um, now to wrap up everything that I said so far, what can uncomfortable chairs teach us about inclusive design? Um, if you take away one thing from this presentation, I would like it to be to not fall into the averages trap. And I will leave you with this um, anecdote that I really love, which is about the statistician who knew that um, the sea was on average um, three feet deep, went into the sea and drowned because averages don't really tell us anything about the reality of things. They don't really tell us about kind of the extreme situations. They don't really tell us uh, they don't really give us any valuable information that we can use in order to kind of make um, informed choices. The other thing that I would like to leave you with is design for the extremes with everyone else in mind. Now, I think the idea is that we should always be aware of what the extreme users in, you know, our situations and our designs are. And then make sure that we also um, design what we design for them, but we also um, kind of um, are aware of everyone else. So everyone that is uh, the proportion of people kind of in the middle, in the middle of our bell curve and making sure that those people are actually also comfortable and cared for. So where do we start with this? I would um, encourage you to look at who your extreme users are. Um, so is it possible that maybe there is a difference between a user who encounters your product for the first time versus someone who is an experienced user of your product? And in comparing that to everyone else who is in the middle and understanding how different people encounter and use your product, 
is it um, important to maybe take into consideration the user's mental state? Um, there is a really interesting story about um, nuclear power plant uh, control room designs and how um, in the 70s, I believe, there was um, kind of uh, a, an accident in a nuclear power plant and upon, upon closer inspection, similar to kind of the, the US military plane story, um, they actually uh, realized that the, um, the controls in the control room are not necessarily designed for people under high stress. So if you know that something's going wrong, and you're under stress, you're not necessarily going to be able to find the right button to press to understand what the different switches does and to be able to follow the proper process in order to avoid an accident, which obviously in the case of a nuclear power plant is quite important. And then, you know, if you if you look at this kind of extreme case and compare that to a user who is potentially, you know, really relaxed, um, potentially also may be distracted because they are relaxed. Is there a significant difference when you look at those two user groups? And is there a significant difference between those two user groups and everyone else that is a user of your product? You could also look at environmental factors. Um, if you are designing a digital product that is meant to be uh, you know, consumed through a screen, is there a difference between someone uh, kind of consuming that product outside in the bright sunshine um, versus someone who is maybe consuming that product in the evening in a dark room. Uh, do you need to take considerations around contrast, um, maybe around other things related to how um, different people encounter your product? And then, of course, as a... Um, as an accessibility specialist, the extremes that I am very often concerned with are, you know, people with disabilities and people with uh, different assistive technology use. Um, and it was only last week that I got reminded that sometimes you do have extremes within the extremes. So you need to actually dig deeper. And what I'm talking about here is I was doing some user testing um, with uh, users with vision loss. Um, and I actually uh, I got reminded that there is a significant difference sometimes in the experience between users who are in the process of, you know, losing their vision and might be new to screen readers versus users who have been living with vision loss for, you know, a certain period of time and might actually be on the other extreme and be super proficient with their screen reader use. Um, so kind of determining what those two experiences are and whether we need to take considerations from both and apply them to you know the design of of certain product or certain experience and see how that actually fits within everyone else's experience so on that note i would also like to kind of remind you to always test interview observe whatever works for your product but do it with both extreme users and with everyone else. The benefit of that is that you will encounter the extremes and you will also be able to validate your insights with kind of your more average user, even if we consider that there is no such thing as an average user with users that might not necessarily be on your two extremes. And finally, be mindful of data biases. So be able to you know, whether you are um, collecting certain data or you are using data that someone else has collected, be mindful of your own personal biases, but also the biases of whoever collected that data, how the data was collected. Is there maybe a better way to get a, you know, um, a kind of wider understanding of, of people's needs? Do you maybe need to consider another data set to kind of give you more information? about the population that you are designing for. So thank you. Um, it has been a pleasure talking to you about chairs and the lessons that we can learn from them. And you can find me pretty much anywhere using my full name or um, the handle Tveta Di. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much, Sweta. That was a that was a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm always very happy to see talks that are not about a particular subject until kind of there's the reveal at the end, because it, it keeps you guessing as you go through. And uh, as an audience member, you you kind of draw your own parallels. Uh, and you could leave it quite mysteriously and say, well, I'm, I'm not saying that. That's your interpretation. But no, it was uh, it was great. I was also just towards the end when you talked about uh, people operating nuclear power plants. I mean, it's it's nothing compared to that. But I have to say, as, as somebody who's currently juggling four different windows to make sure the streaming works and the chat and everything else, uh, yes, the user interfaces of most of these things that we're using currently today are just not good for people who are distracted and stressed at the same time, which is kind of uh, my situation at the moment. So I can I can fully empathise with that. Uh, Ian, did we have any questions? I haven't spotted any uh, on the socials, but I do have a couple of questions. And I think the first one, possibly a little bit mean, but I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit um, <laughs> better as you've noted with chair designs if you were designed only for the average user which doesn't really exist mm -hmm. we might not have some of the more iconic chair designs that you showcased and the same could be said of, of web pages if we designed for the average user whatever that is um could that mean that we lose out on some of the more creative designs and so how, how do we ensure that inclusive design be that chairs or web pages doesn't stifle creativity well i think that's an interesting question because yes definitely particularly when it comes to chair design and you know chair design from the past century when ergonomic considerations were not really that common we might have lost on some of these um, kind of great examples of design but I do think that you need to be very clear what is the purpose that you know who are you designing for and what is the purpose of your design? So I did show a lot of examples of chairs that, um, you know, and particularly on my last slide, for example, I had the, you know, the chair that is made of stuffed animals. Um, you know, that's not necessarily a chair that's made for sitting. Um, so if you are maybe creating, you know, a, you know, a web-based product or a physical product that is, you know, made to be more of an art piece. I think it's okay for you to, you know, be more creative. But if you are designing something that is to be consumed by a large portion of the population in a situation where they actually need to, you know, go through a certain journey and understand how that product works and be able to use that product in their everyday life, I think you have a responsibility to, you know, you know, not necessarily overlook aesthetics, but to focus on the usability of the product and try to marry that with the aesthetics as much as you can. At least that's my perspective on things. And you mentioned, I think it was called the, the monoblock chair, the, the the plastic stacking chair. Yeah. Um, which, you know, we see worldwide. What would you say is the web equivalent of this? Something that's practical, easy to implement and just works every time? I'm not sure there is an equivalent, um, at least not yet. And the reason why I say this is because, you know, maybe I'm kind of like very focused on the problems that we experience in our everyday kind of digital use. But I think we're not, you know, given how inaccessible the web is still, what a huge percentage of the web is, it is just not accessible to so many people. I think we're, you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, and we're trying to figure out what that is, but I'm not sure I can point to necessarily an example that works. Patrick had an idea there, didn't you? Yeah. What was your, what what was your suggestion, Patrick? Oh yeah, uh, it, I'm going to be that person that says not a question, more of a more of a statement. Uh, but uh, particularly when you when you talked about, uh, I think it was in the context of office chairs uh, that they are designed to start with for the the average uh, person but then they uh, invariably need to include kind of adaptability so that you know there there are levers and settings where you can actually adapt that standard chair uh, to yourself uh, 
and and I think that that's an interesting parallel, uh, particularly for web, where there's a there's a big push. Well, now that we're getting the tools to do that for uh, more customizable websites uh, or things with like you know, absolutely media queries uh, is one example, but even just you know sites and apps that actually give the user empower the user to make settings and changes, change the you know light mode, dark mode. Uh, font preferences, size, and everything else. So I, I just thought that that was an interesting kind of way of kind of squaring that circle of you have to design it in some way and you can't account for basically the entire gamut of possible uh, user shapes, sizes, needs, wants, uh, situational uh, you know, constraints. Uh, so maybe the emphasis will be more and more, hopefully, towards, uh, you know, designing adaptable websites and giving users more power to, to actually change the way they're experiencing these, these digital products. And you can't I, overlay. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, no overlays. Actually, when you started talking about this, I was like, I hope we're not talking about Oh, overlay. no, no, <laughs> Ab absolutely not. I'm, 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 I'm not getting uh, the monthly paycheck anymore from them, so I'm not going <laughs> to not gonna talk about them. But yeah, Patrick, you did have a suggestion that as the, as the equivalent for the monoblock chair was uh, the WordPress site with the basic bootstrap thing. Possibly, <laughs> yes. I, I like that, actually. I like that because do, do we actually have, I mean, the monoblock is so popular, but do we actually have proof of how ergonomic it is? We know that a lot of people use it. it it's probably not ideally ergonomic, but I think, yeah, there are equivalents of that. Yeah, certainly it's, online. It's kind of good enough, isn't it? It's like, yeah. you know, yeah. no, excellent. And as a, as a last point, uh, I was reminded early on in, in your talk uh, on the topic of chairs and everything else, and I've posted it on, on Mastodon as well, that back in 2007 or whatever it was, I wrote an article. It was in the context of web standards, but I wrote an article uh, for .NET magazine, rest in peace, uh, uh, titled The Artisan and the Mass Producer, where I basically made the argument of, you know, handcrafted websites from people that really know their web standards. And yes, they, they will be beautiful and every markup element was chosen exactly because it represents what you're trying to convey, which is great, but it, it's not a scalable uh, kind of approach if you've got a website that needs to create hundreds of thousands of things. Back in the day, I was, I was working as a web editor for a, a university so we had lots of distributed authors and i could not with the best will in the world tell them all no you need to sit down and you know handcraft all your pages so uh, i think the argument i made back in in that article was effectively that yes the, the mass produced aspect won't have all the the nice design details that an artisan constructed kind of item will have but sometimes it's kind of good enough and uh, you know if the if if the question is between, uh, you know, yes, we can produce one of these pages or items in a, in a month versus we can produce hundreds of thousands, then if the need is there, the good enough may have to be good enough. But back in those days, there was very little uh, scope for the uh, adaptability and everything else. So hope, hopefully, as I said, you know, this, this can kind of be married together uh, again these days. So, yeah, yeah. exciting stuff. Oh, excellent. Uh, well, once again, thank you very much, uh, Sveta. Thank and thank you, Ian, uh, as well. I think this is your last uh, co-hosting slot. Uh, it of is the indeed. Day. It is, yes. I'll shed a little tear later. Um, so in the meantime, uh, I would say to the audience at home, uh, if you like this session, uh, you know, uh, like and subscribe, as the kids say. And uh, don't forget, you can subscribe to, obviously, uh, Inclusive Design 24 uh, YouTube channel itself. So you'll see uh, any future updates and future events. And Inclusive Design 24 is brought to you with thanks to our supporters, Google, Intopia, Barrier Break, Tetralogical, Intuit, Infoaxia, and the Law Office of Laney Feingold. Now, Inclusive Design will be back on the hour in about 10 minutes or so uh, with our next session. So see you then. And once again, thank you very much. <laughs>